Okay. So as per usual, thank you for allowing me to come and present at the Junzan Tendai Temple. Uh, my name is Maxim Um I it's uh, I've been doing a few presentations here. Uh, in an, this is a interesting topic for me because it's uh, I guess I'm stepping a little more outside of my comfort zone. As people have probably know, like uh, my own research, my PhD and stuff focus on um, like Kamakura era Japanese Buddhism. So going further than that, going to Nagarjuna steps outside a bit of my comfort zone, but uh, I'm going to try to make it uh, as comprehensible as I can. Um, you'll note that I forgot to change the date on the slide, so please uh, forget that, the, that mistake. So yeah, today I'm going to be talking about uh, Nagarjuna and specifically diving about some of the context, uh, some of the content in his uh, Mulama Jamaka Karaka, which is what is considered to be his like, uh, primary work. So what today is going to look like is, uh, there it is. So we're going to talk about, first of all, who is Nagarjuna? So talking about the person, a bit about the historical context and the impact that, that he had. Uh, then, as I mentioned, we're going to dive a little bit into the Mula Majama Kakarika, uh, one of his primary work. Uh, just as um, like, you know, with the length of those presentation and the fact that I'm taking time to talk about the person and the historical context means that I'm going to have to do a very, you know, brief survey of what is written in there. Uh, I decided to focus on what I believe is kind of like the main message. But I think that, you know, a lot of us reading the same text could come up with different conclusions because there's so much content in there. Um, I think it's it's the thing that I got from it and what I understood to be the main idea that is being trying to convey in that text. So this is what I'll be focusing on tonight. Uh, I like to do the disclaimer of, you know, I feel very privileged to be able to come here to do these presentations. But I just want to say that, you know, my view of these things is not necessarily the view that Tendai endorses or Koshin or Moshin Sensei or Ichishima Sensei. So I just want to say that, you know, take this with a grain of salt uh, in that sense and don't Claim, I don't want to claim that what I'm saying today is what all Tendai Buddhist people would say about it. Uh, and then we're going to end about a, on a conclusion about some of the connections between uh, Nagarjuna's work and Tendai Buddhism specifically, and what can we learn from this text. So, first of all, still talk about the person. So the um, it is said that he lived in about 150 to 250 CE, so common era after year zero. Um, there's the earliest source on the topic is Kum Kumarajiva's biography of Nagarjuna, which was translated into Chinese in 405. So it's the some of the first sources are still 200 plus years after he lived. Uh, and according to this biography specifically, Nagarjuna was born into a Brahmin family and later became a Buddhist. One thing to know about Nagarjuna is that the historical, uh, either in terms of books and also the archaeological data is like almost non-existent. What we have come from traditional religious hagiographies, which have been written like very late after uh, he was, after he lived. So the traditional religious hagiographies are also inconsistent about where Nagarjuna lived, but most of them place him either in the central or northern areas of India, or what we currently understand as India. It wasn't India back then. Uh, some scholars supported by traditional hagiographies believe him to have been an advisor to the king of Satavahana dynasty, which ruled central India during the second century, which is part of the dates that you're seeing there. Uh, is the assumption that he might have lived during that time and been an advisor to a king. Um, Tibetan hagiographies posit that Nagarjuna studied at the famous Nalanda University, uh, but Chinese hagiographies do not mention that information at all, uh, which is very interesting because a lot of the Chinese people like Chuangzang went to Nalanda University to get Buddhist texts. And at Nalanda University at his time, they didn't mention that Nagarjuna was there. So a lot of people are kind of disputing that. Um, and also some other scholar disagree uh, with the fact that he studied at Nalanda University because Nalanda University only became a strong monastic center in like the five, the fifth century, which is 200, 300 years after he lived. But it is still possible that at some point in his life, 
He established himself in the Nalanda region. Uh, it just wasn't the famous university at that time. One thing also that is important to note is that there's a multitude of texts that's attributed to Nagarjuna, but many were written, written in much later periods. Uh, generally speaking, there are at least five texts that have consistently been established to be written by him, but some Tibetan traditions ascribe as much as 116 texts to him. Uh, the text generally acknowledged to be the most important, or at least the most known, is the one that I will be discussing today. Now, moving away from the person about the historical context, um, we know that um, since King Ashoka, uh, that started about 250 BCE, uh, Buddhism kind of became the state religion until about 250 CE, so during the time that he lived. Uh, the Nagarjuna is assumed to have lived, it would have been the state religion. Again, keep in mind that it wasn't like India was a unified state in the way we understand it right now, but it's uh, like the political elites at the time would have primarily been following Buddhism. And the country was fragmented politically. So again, it wasn't one entity. You had the Kushans that were, is, that were in North India that ruled uh, until about 225 CE. And then the Satavahana, that I just mentioned earlier ruled until about 200 CE, and Nagarjuna was uh, is believed in some contexts have been advisor to their king. So you had different dynasties, different things happening. Um, so political fragmentation, but in the elite sphere of society, uh, Buddhism was kind of like the I guess like the part of the main tradition at that point. Now, with regards to Mahayana Buddhism specifically at that time, so at this point in Buddhist history. The Buddhist community was already divided into various Buddhist schools uh, that had spread throughout the country. And the Abhidharma traditions were particularly influential. Uh, there was already a small nascent Mahayana movement, but the Mahayana ideas were held by a minority of Buddhists at that time. Uh, the Mahayana sutras were circulating at the time of Nagarjuna. And various traditional hagiographies mention that Nagarjuna was teaching what is called the 8,000 lines Prajna Paramita Sutra, more specifically. So there were already Mahayana texts circulating at the time. Nagarjuna was teaching some of them. So now moving on into the impact uh, of Nagarjuna. So the first thing that's important to mention, uh, which I'm going to dive more into it later when I look at the text specifically, but um, Nagarjuna is, is known to criticize the essentialist propositions of some of uh, Nikaya Buddhist schools, which were the dominant one at the time, like the Adhidharma school, the Vaibhasika school, the Pugdalavada school, as well as also non-Buddhist traditions, such as the Brahmanis, Brahmana school, Brahmanial school, uh, which also posited a kind of essentialist view of the world. And what I mean by essentialist is the idea that things have a self-existence or swabhava. So he was very much criti criticizing that idea. But the thing that's important to understand is that Nagarjuna did not invent Mahayana Buddhism. Like I mentioned a bit earlier, um, Mahayana texts were already circulating at the time. And he was teaching a text that became kind of one of the core texts of Mahayana Buddhism, but he did not invent the tradition. Uh, scholars have noted that although reading his work clearly places him in the camp of the Mahayanist, there's also nothing particularly Mahayanist about the texts that we for sure know he wrote. So, for example, no specifically Mahayana doctrines are defended or promoted in his text, and he does not quote any of the Mahayana sutras in his text either. In fact, the only sutra that he explicitly quoted in his work is from Nikaya Buddhism. Yet the position he's defending in the Mula Majamaka Karaka is a doctrine that is common to most, if not all, Buddhist schools. So what explains that people have kind of decided to make him, you know, like the father of Mahayana Buddhism? Well, it is often said that uh, Nagarjan, Nagarjuna um, if he didn't, it's often said that he founded the Madhyamaka school of Buddhism, but there are good reasons to believe, just like Mahayana, that these schools existed before him. But his work kind of made him 
I guess, become the most known spokesperson for this particular school. However, his work gave rise to two new Madhyamaka school, the Prasangika and Zvatantrika school. And each of these schools produced commentaries that were then important to China, Tibet, and were part of the key Mahayana texts that were translated into these new cultures. So these texts from the Madhyamaka school, combined with the text from the Vijnavada school, also called the Yogacara, form the large part of the Mahayana text that spread throughout East Asia. And this is basically what cemented Nagarjuna's position as a central figure in Mahayana Buddhism. So that's about him, his time period, what was going on at the time, politically, religiously. Now I'm going to talk a bit more about the text uh, per se. So the Mula Majamaka Karaka. First thing I like to do with these things is distill, you know, the text. Uh, what does it say? What does it mean? Um, so mula is a root. Uh, talk about the root of a tree, but also the root of something like the core uh, of something where it starts. Majamaka is made of three different things. So maja means middle. Ma is a superlative that is a suffix that you add in a word that basically means the most something. So in this case, it's like the most middle. And ka is, uh, you turn something into an adjective by adding this suffix. Uh, oftentimes it turns word into the expression something ing at the end, like do doing kind of thing. And karaka is verse. Uh, it's a way of writing. Uh, and the, the translation that we use is generally verse. So if we put all of this together, there is the kind of more literal translation and then the way it's generally translated. So the literal one would sound something like verses on the roots of the most middling, which is very confusing. So a lot of people just translate it at, as root verses on the middle way. Uh, there's something a bit, in my mind, a bit missing, but sometimes, yeah, you have to, you got to do what you got to do to make uh, translations understandable. So. This is what the name of the text means. Now, with regards to the structure of the text, it's 450 verses that are organized in 27 chapters. So it is extremely concise and very dense in terms of what you're reading. And the last thing I want to say about the structure is about the Kataka style work. So written works that are written in verses. So at that period of time, when things are in, in verses, it oftentimes means that it was meant for memorization. So these texts that are written in Kataka style work, so they're shorter and they're rhythmic, they have verses and poetry, so they're meant for memorization, means that it was supposed to be a learning aid for a student. And the gaps that would be in the text would normally be filled by a master or someone that would write commentaries on it, etc. So the goal of Karaka style works was to outline the major arguments of an oral tradition. It would kind of give you the broad overview that you could easily memorize through chanting, and but it wouldn't give you everything that has to be in there. Whatever is missing from the summary of that outline, then you'd have to go ask someone to clarify, a master that knows better, or someone would write commentaries to try to dig a little bit deeper. So it's a text that basically says a lot without going too deep in a format that's supposed to be easy to remember. So this is for the structure of the text. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about its content. So the first thing that's important to emphasize, and it's one of the things that Nagarjuna himself starts with in the work, is talking about uh, Sobhava versus Sunyata. So... The method that Nagarjuna uses in his work to go about making his argument is what is called, what is known as the Tetralemna, uh, Katushkoti. And it's an important formulation in Indian and Buddhist logic. So it's just a like, you know, some of us might have courses in like Western philosophy and logic and how to construct an argument with the sophism and uh, fallacies and all that kind of stuff. This is part of what would be kind of like the Indian logical logic system. So what that looks like is the tetralamna position is there's two configuration, the positive and the negative one. The positive says something around the lines of A exists, 
A does not exist. A both exists and does not exist. And A neither exists nor does not exist. This is the positive formulation. Now for the negative, it's that but the negative, right? A doesn't exist. A does not not exist. A both doesn't exist and doesn't not exist. So you just follow that formulation. And basically what Nagarjuna does is apply the positive and the negative configurations of this tetralemna, this logical system, with the intent of investigating whether it is possible to think that being has swabhava or self-existence. So what he would do, he would be like, if you look at the positive configuration, it would be, does self like self-existent exist? And then you argue. Self-existence does not exist. And then you argue. Self-existence both exists and does not exist. And then you argue. So you just do that. You know, you take self-existence, you apply it to all of the four steps, in this case, the eight steps of the Tetralemna, and you draw conclusions from there. So having put the Swabahava theories uh, to test, um, applying the Tetralemna, et cetera, Nagarjuna's conclusion is that it is impossible to think of anything having self-existence, no matter the context. So no matter you know which of these steps you're following, it's impossible to think about anything having self-existence, Swabhava. The logical conclusion is therefore that the only thing that remains is Shunyata or emptiness. So the way Nagarjuna goes about the way, oh, sorry, I forgot to click the little slide here. So the way Nagarjuna goes about doing his argument is not to argue or to convince his reader that emptiness is like better than everything. Rather, it's that emptiness is the only way left to think about things because thinking in terms of self-existence simply doesn't make any logical sense. In other words, Nagarjuna doesn't really argue for emptiness, but rather against self-existence. And what is important to remember is that emptiness does not mean something like the void of that there is nothing at all. Rather, it is that things are empty of self-existence. Is not emptiness as a whole is empty of something, in this case, empty of self-existence. And the process of the tetralemna logic even produces that, if we look at it carefully, which I think is interesting, because it takes an affirmation of self-existence, and then it kind of goes about emptying this using logic. Oh, point A, I am, that's not true. I like you empty self-existence out of it. And at the end of this process, you're left with things that have been emptied of self-existence, which is the conclusion. But why is it impossible to think about things having not having self-existence, right? Why, why is it, how do we get to that conclusion? So before answering that, I got to take you a bit on a journey to clarify what is meant by Sobhava or self-existence. So the key idea is that a being that has self-existence exists independently of everything else. It exists by its own power, and so its nature and existence is due only to itself. It exists by itself, for its own self, by its own power. So within this framework, this means that beings who have Swabahava necessarily cannot be created and cannot come to be. They cannot cease to exist or be eliminated, so they are eternal. They cannot be affected by any action and therefore cannot change. They cannot be the cause or the result of anything. And they cannot be connected to anything in any way. To, there's any Because you have to exist on your own independently of anything else, it means you have no connection to anything else ever. And for Nagarjuna, not only does this not make sense logically, when you apply the tetralemna, but also it contradicts our fundamental experience of the world around us. The world around us, when you look everywhere, you see things change, you see things die, you see things being created. So it's got that that, that framework doesn't make sense if 
you know, if you have Subhava, then you cannot be created. You cannot see, you cannot be affected. You can like, like look around you. You can't see that anywhere. So in, in your experience, you can't see that being true. But also when you apply logic to it, you also reach the conclusion that that cannot work. Nagarjuna then points to the Buddha's propositions of dependent co-origination or uh, pratitya samutpada to explain why it is the case that things are that, like that. So we're going to dive a little bit into pratitya samutpada, which is also what Nagarjuna does. So in a nutshell, this means that all things exist in a relation of dependency upon other things. A, a simple formula would be something like, if this exists, that exists. If this ceases to exist, this also ceases to exist. So the ifs of this formula is what are called conditions. So all things are dependent on conditions for their existence, which are the ifs, right? It's conditional on their existence. If this happened, this happened. So it's all conditional. And without those conditions... So when the conditions are present, a thing comes into existence. Without those conditions, the thing would cease to exist. A thing is thus dependent on the existence of the conditions for its existence. That's the Pratyasamutpada formula. Now, in the Mula Majamaka Karaka, Nagarjuna dedicated two chapters to speaking more specifically on conditions or conditioned beings. And he says the following two things. So first of all, chapter one, verse five, he says, conditions are called conditions because something arises dependent upon something else. And on chapter seven, verse one, the three characteristic of conditioned things is that they arise, they injure, and they cease. So they, they, they get born, they live, and they die. This is the, the characteristics of things that are operating within a conditioned system. So because a thing is dependent on certain condi conditions for its existence, it means that any changes in the conditions would result in changes in the things too. And this is why we can see that things are born, they injure, and they die. And this is also exactly why things cannot be said to have self-existence. So we said earlier that self-existence necessarily assume that a thing is independent, meaning it exists on its own and not connected or conditioned by any other things. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, um, a, a being with self-existence cannot be born, cannot change, cannot die. It's eternal. It cannot have a cause or an effect. So... But just like when the Buddha encountered, you know, sickness, old age, death, when he left the palace, it's part of our common experience of the world to see things being born, grow, decay, die, change, etc. So Nagarjuna dismisses the possibility of self-existence, yes, because it's metaphysically illogical with the Tetralena, but also because all the things we see around us cannot be possible within a self-existence framework. According to him, and based on the Buddhist teachings, it is only when we can understand things as being empty of Swabhava that we can have a true insight into the reality to which we are all part of. Any attempt at organizing reality through a self-existence framework simply means that we're looking at the world through the projections of our own mind. But still, there's a more crucial reason why it is important, and maybe even mandatory, as Buddhists, to think of the world as empty of self-existence because of dependent co-origination. So this is not just a philosophical argument just for the sake of it, of like, let's talk about existence. There's a very crucial reason why it's important to not see the world through a self-existence framework and see it through an emptiness, empty of self-existence framework. Oh, sorry, forgot to click this one. And that is because dependent co-origination also explain why and how suffering or dukkha arises. So, for example, in uh, chapter 12, verse 2, Nagarjuna said, 
if suffering was self-cause, then it would not arise dependently. So self-existence is a problem for Buddhists because the Four Noble Truths, on which all Buddhisms are based, basically says that suffering is caused by something and there's something you can do to stop it. This means that if suffering is conditioned, it cannot have self-existence. In other words, oh, sorry. In other words, if suffering had self-existence, it could never disappear. Suffering would be eternal, and there's nothing anyone or anything could do about it. So, what is the cause of suffering then? So, chapter 26, verse 10 says, The one who is subject to root ignorance, avidya, forms the dispositions that are at the basis of the cycle of rebirths. So, avidya is often translated as ignorance. Uh, the more literal translation would be something like not seeing. So, a uh, is not, and then vidya is seeing or knowing. So, it would be not seeing or not, not knowing. And I actually think that the literal translation is maybe a bit more true, especially in the context of what Nagarjuna is kind of trying to tell us, which is that not seeing that things are empty of self-existence is what create the conditions from which suffering arises. So in Buddhist jargon, avidya is the first step of the 12 links of dependent co-origination leading to suffering and rebirth. And I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Kaiden did a presentation not so long ago on the 12 links of dependent co-origination. So uh, that like avidya or ignorance or not seeing properly is the first step that leads to this process of rebirth, suffering, etc. But on the flip side, chapter 26, verse 10 says, with root ignorance, so avidya, with not seeing, ceasing, dispositions do not come together. However, the cessation of root ignorance comes through meditative development and through knowledge. So just as not seeing that things are empty of self-existence creates the condition for suffering, seeing that all things are empty of self-existence is the cure. And because it is the first step of the 12 links of dependent co-origination, the thing that starts the whole process of suffering and rebirth, if you're able to cure ignorance, then none of the 11 steps that follows are going to happen. And this is why it's specifically important for Buddhism, because if uh, it's one of the one of the things that Monshin Sensei said uh, when I first arrived at TBI that really kind of you know stuck with me is, you know, Buddhism is about suffering. It's about how did it happen and how do you stop it? So why is it important to understand the world not having self-existence? It's connected to suffering again. Because if things had self-existence, you couldn't stop suffering and suffering would just exist forever. But with an emptiness framework that you understand everything to be interconnected, it means, ah, if I change this, then suffering can stop. So there's a way to end that suffering, which is what Buddhism is about you know, uh, at its core, at least the Four Noble Truth. So leaning towards the conclusion slowly but surely, I'm going to talk a bit about the relationship to Tendai specifically. So Nagarjuna is taken to be the first patriarch of Tendai Buddhism. Uh, just for context, Tsuyi wrote the Makashikan is the fourth patriarch. A key text of the tradition is the, pardon my pronunciation, but the Datsi Dulun, which was wrongly attributed to Nagarjuna. Again, there's a lot of texts that have been attributed to him, but uh, this text is very often quoted in uh, Zhi's Makashikan. So regardless of whether he wrote it or not, in people's minds, he wrote this text, and therefore it's like he has a major impact in, in the tradition because we perceived him to have been written these key texts that are at the core of everything. And even in our lineage, we trace it back to be it. It all started with him. Uh, in the Tendai lineage, I think a very clear one of the the you know the core component of Tendai Buddhism uh, that directly connects with uh, the Mula Majjhima Karika is the relationship between the threefold threefold truth doctrine that's at the core of Tendai, 
that is perceived to be, it's been explicitly stated by Ziyi and other writers to be an expansion of the twofold truth doctrine that you found in, a, in the Mula Majama Kakaraka. So just as a very brief survey, because, you know, we're um, starting to lack on time. So the two truth system is kind of like there's the truth of emptiness, which is the truth that when you've cleared yourself of, you know, seeing when you've stopped experiencing the world through the lens of self-existence, you can see the world through the truth of things being empty of self-existence. And which is like the absolute truth. And then you have the provisional truth, which are the truth of the everyday phenomena that we have it. So it's like a two truth system. You, you have the provisional and you have the ultimate. The provisional one is one that's still embedded into the realities of the world. And when you see the world through the left, the lens of emptiness, then you kind of experience the world to the truth of absolute. And what Tendai has done is actually uh, you should live in the middle of these. So you should have kind of one foot in both truths at the same time, which is the, the, the goal is not to claim that, oh, the absolute truth is the absolute best and you need to go there but you're living in the provisional world still at the same time. So are you able to be in the middle of the two truth and navigate this the world through that space? And this is where the, the kind of like, I guess, the, the expansion of the contribution of Tendai Buddhism to this doctrine of truth uh, comes in. It's very much at the core of what uh, Tendai Buddhism has been about. So leaning more into the conclusion, um, what can we learn? At least what did what did I learn? I guess from from when I did the presentation. Um, first of all, is a reminder of what are we cultivating in our practices. So whether through meditation or knowledge, the goal of all practice is or should be to experience the truth that all things are empty of self-existence. And why is it important? and not mandatory to experience the truth that all things are empty of self-existence, well, because this is the key to clear ourselves of the poison of ignorance, which creates the conditions for the arising of suffering. So again, it all ties back to suffering, getting rid of suffering, and the thing that causes suffering is our inability to see that things are empty of self-existence, which is uh, like what basically the, the Four Noble Truths are, are saying. Another thing that's maybe a, a, le a bit less, uh, you know, into the, the work, but I think that to me personally, I think it's just always important to have a bit of understanding of what the ancestors have said, uh, to which our own tradition has been built upon. So it's always sometimes we read a bunch of different texts and different contexts and different things, and we don't always take the time to go back to what the ancestors have said. So I like to kind of take on that role of bringing the ancestors and what they've said to the table in translations, albeit. But nonetheless, it's important to have a bit of understanding of where our tradition comes from uh, and what the people have said, and that leads to where we're at today. So this uh, this is the uh, presentation. This is the sources that I've used. So I've used the, the, the Jones translation of the Mula Majama Kakaraka. There's a bunch of works in there, but I, I've used this one specifically. And for the, the history side of thing, I just uh, had a, a book on Buddhism's history in general that I also used. So, so that is the end of the presentation. And uh, I guess we can uh, close the recording for the question period. Um, and I think that we should probably allow Uchishima Sensei to have the first comments uh, on the presentation. But thank you, everyone. And uh, I appreciate the honor being here again. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, um, Maxim. Yes, Uchishima Sensei, is there anything you would like to add about Nagarjuna or the Mujimet uh, Maraka Kakarika? Well, thank you very much. And uh, such a wonderful presentation about Murama Diem Kakarika by Nagarjuna. And Nagarjuna uh, is said to be a founder of Mahayana Buddhism. And the Tenta I really followed uh, him, uh, Nagarjuna, uh, especially Trinity Truths uh, of the uh, GEs, really uh, based upon Murama Diem Kakarika, I think, and also developed. Uh, in the case of Tendai, developed a more practical way uh, in terms of shamatha vipassana, or, you know, city, <laughs> some calmness and discernment. 
Uh, and the, according to Ratnakara Shanti, who, who was a very uh, important person of uh, the history of Buddhism at the 10th century, the last, uh, last what shall I say, uh, temple existed in uh, India uh, up until the 11th century. It was uh, Bikramashira Monastery, and there were four uh, gate keepers. One of the keepers was North Keepers, is Ratnakara Shanti, who made a commentary to the uh, Sutra Samuchaya attributed to Nagarjuna. And according to Ratnakara Shanti, uh, of his, uh, uh, what shall I say, uh, 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 commentaries to the Sutra Samuchaya collection of Mahayana Sutras, uh, he says that uh, uh, you know the development of uh, turning wheels. Uh, first, uh, Buddha Shakamuni uh, turned the uh, first wheel at the uh, uh, Yeah Park. That is uh, really for noble truth. Uh, this is uh, basis. And then uh, the third century, second third century, Nagarjuna developed uh, so emptiness theory or sunyata uh, non. Co-arising existence. Uh, this is very, very depth and very important for the development of Mahayana Buddhism. So, and also uh, succeeding uh, to the Nagarjuna, Asanga, and Vasubandhu made a Yogacara system. These uh, two uh, pioneering scholars, like um, uh, Nagarjuna and Asanga, Vasubandhu's. Um, they are called the second turning wheel of the Buddhism, uh, according to uh, the com uh, commentator of the Sutra Samchaya, Ratnakara Shanti. And the thirdly, the third turning uh, point, uh, turning wheel of the Dharma uh, uh, is uh, Kamarashira, who developed uh, more, what sorry, six uh, parameters, like uh, Upaya and Prajna. So Upaya and Prajna uh, really uh, makes moksha, uh, freedom from all attachment. That is the basis is Mahakarna, compassion. Without compassion, do not develop anything. Very, very basis is compassion. Uh, uh, this is my uh, feeling. Uh, and thank you very much, such a deep studies of Muramadhyamika, uh, Karikas, etc. Uh, Maxim, thank you. This is my comment. Thank you so much. Thank you.